This video contains spoilers for Stronghold 2's military campaign and will follow the narrative of the good path option in the story. Welcome, lords and ladies, to the second chapter of The Lore of Stronghold 2, our mini-series dedicated to exploring the stories, events and characters which populated the chaotic civil war between the Loyalists of the King and the rebels of Lord Barclay and Pascal Devereux. Last time, we visited the exploits of Sir William, one of the most prominent figures of Stronghold II. But here, we shall turn to the true hero of the piece, Matthew Steele, an unlikely hero who had to learn the ways of politics and warfare in a matter of weeks. Join us as we continue our exploration of this devastating time, where England collapsed inwards and countrymen fought countrymen in a time of unrelenting turmoil and turbulence. On the column! Charge! Oil away! For the crown! The castle is falling! Unlike Sir William, Matthew Steele's past is largely unknown. He was not born of noble birth, but instead, his story begins with him being fortuitously plucked from the unremarkable life of a commoner. Much of his fortune could be attributed to his sharp instincts and physical build. A large, broad man, he was capable and strong, a towering figure in his hometown who was called upon to help in all manner of workshops. He became renowned for both his workmanship and his attitude, a reliant local hero who grasped onto all manner of disciplines and professions quickly, becoming a man of many flares and skills. Matthew's town was always plagued by local bandits, criminal outlaws who hid and scurried in the nearby woodlands, robbing and harassing merchants, traders and workers who travelled beyond the town in search of a living, they were a constant menace. The local lord responded, calling on the royal army to assist. It was then that Sir William arrived, a newly promoted knight serving in the ranks of the army. He lodged in a local tavern within the town and, one fateful morning, just so happened to share a breakfast table with Matthew. The two struck a fast friendship. Matthew was fascinated by the life of soldiers and knights and, in turn, William was pleasantly surprised by this stranger's outlook and attitude. Matthew offered assistance in both guiding the royal forces around the area and advising Sir William on how to approach these local bandits, having dealt with them on occasion before. Within merely a week, the bandits had been chased out of the county, with both William and Matthew able to share in the glory. But before leaving, William offered Matthew a position as his page. Unusually old for the position, Matthew hesitated, but thought it foolish to refuse a potential pathway out of a life of mundane, back-breaking work. What followed were years of camaraderie and learning. Sir William taught Matthew everything he knew of the way of a knight in a rather unconventional relationship. Matthew was quick to pick up on the art of combat, but perhaps less so the intricacies of diplomacy. Owing to his humble beginnings, he found it hard to grasp the language of the courts and the delicacy of manners. But he more than made up for this in his aptitude for battlefield strategy and popularity with his fellow soldiers. It created a dichotomy within him, confident with a sword in hand, but still unable to shake the feeling of merited ascension, feeling alien amongst those of noble birth as he stumbled in his speech and decorum. When the Civil War struck England, chaos ensued. Towns were pillaged, castles besieged, and people were slaughtered. Matthew would find himself in the eye of the storm as page to Sir William, the latter embarking on a quest to find the missing king and bring stability and peace back to the land. With the rebel movement gaining traction as Lord Barclay and Edwin Blackfriar joined Pascal Devereux in their revolt against the king, 
The list of William's allies grew thin. Loyal and capable lords and their fearsome fighters were becoming ever rare, but in this bleak picture, Matthew was granted the opportunity of a lifetime. Sir William entrusted him with his first command as he embarked on yet another mission to find the king, leaving Matthew to build up the loyalist forces in his absence. Sir William had always seen potential in Matthew, and now it was time for that potential to be realized. He slowly built up his confidence and command, helping the local peasants, monks, and military of nearby counties. With every bandit captured and village rebuilt, Matthew grew bolder. Olaf, the last of the Viking lords, appeared, hired by Pascal to dispatch William, and with him, Matthew. A ferocious battle took place as the long swords of the English entangled with the battle axes of the Vikings. But while bloodied, Matthew was victorious. Every minute of Matthew's training now worth a lifetime of gratitude from him to his mentor William. He recounted techniques and sword strokes which granted him the upper hand over the poor men he hacked down. The doubts of inexperience were now shed from him and in the preceding battles, sieges and skirmishes, he remembered his efforts against Olaf and, perhaps more importantly, so did his men. He was now a military commander of the Royal Army, respected by those who fought with him and for him. What followed was a moment of extreme bitter sweetness as Matthew rejoined the forces of William. They had been charged with the besieging of an apparent traitor to the crown, Lady Seren, and rescuing her captive, the then assumedly innocent Edwin Blackfriar. In return, both would gain land and title in their fight against the rebel forces. It was a swift victory, and Edwin was rescued, and so he fulfilled his part of the bargain. Unceremoniously dubbing Matthew a knight, he was now Sir Steel, but unbeknownst to him, he had just been knighted by a traitor. Despite his new title, Matthew still felt the privilege of circumstance. He still felt out of place in the company of lords and ladies and even his fellow knights. He would miss the references of kingly stories and histories and be mocked for his inability to recount heraldry. This was soon forgotten, however, when the same comedian saw him leading the front line of the loyalist forces, taking back castles, towns and fields in the king's name. They regretted their cruel barbs. Despite having countless victories now under his belt, William was still regarded with suspicion among peasants and princes alike. And so Matthew received word that he was to become the new royal champion in England's time of need. This presented Matthew with a dilemma which struck him to his core, as he knew this tearing of position from William to be unjust. But his friend and mentor had been foolhardy lately, landing himself injured and unable to assist the royalists, a result of desperation to repair his reputation after his brother's selfish plot for the crown. Matthew took to his new title of Royal Champion well, advancing the loyalist movement in ever-growing battles and longer sieges. He dispatched the rebel leaders, caging Edwin and forcing the bull to flee. He was so successful in emboldening the king to return to his country. Once a commoner, Matthew now held the admiration and respect of the most important man in England. The war was coming to its peak as Sir William returned from healing, soon proving he was once again capable of victory. And so he, Matthew, and the king reconciled. William's name and trust was restored. Now all that remained was to finally rid England of its plotters. And so the trio combined their armies and marched on Pascal and Barclay, the two remaining leaders of the rebel army. A series of grand sieges took place which would serve as inspirations to troubadours and playwrights for decades to come. So bloody and ferocious were these final skirmishes that generations carried down their legend through campfire stories and bedtime tales. Pascal died an ignoble death, killed in the chaos of battle to an unknown soldier. His plans were unfulfilled and his vision of his new England destroyed. Barclay was more fortunate in some ways. 
He survived the conflict, but was imprisoned, an example of what happened to those who defied the king and felt his godly justice. Caged for the rest of his days, wallowing in some unknown pit, his only sight of the outside world was to be when he was paraded as the shameful traitor he was. Once the dust had settled and peace had returned to the tranquil green hills of England, Matthew feared his title and position endangered. He felt his unusual shortcut to royal champion could be deemed a misjudgment made in a frenzied time of war, certainly considering his lowly birth. But nothing came of it, and Matthew remained royal champion for years to come, with William at his side. Matthew Steele had earned his place in court and in history by his actions and not his lineage. And so ends another chapter of The Law of Stronghold II, covering our most heroic figure, Matthew Steele. Be sure, if you haven't already, to check out our first chapter on Sir William. The link to that video is in the description box below. And of course, to finish, if you enjoyed the video and would like to see more of The Law of Stronghold, please leave a like and subscribe for more Stronghold goodness every month.